Hey guys, welcome to the Biomechanics 1 video series. Uh, this particular lecture is looking at the concepts of friction. Again, it'll be divided into two parts. The first one will be the introduction, and the second part will look at some applied examples. All right, so friction is quite an interesting beast um, from the point of view that everything that we understand about friction is experimentally derived. Uh, it's not just something that we've come up with or anything like that. So a lot of the science around friction is done through experimentation. So different surfaces have different friction coefficients. In other words, um, there's a different resistance to movement. And I'll unpack some of that in, in this particular video. And then I'm also going to show you guys a different video that I think explains it very, very eloquently. Um, so when we have say for example two surfaces let's say i have a biomechanics textbook resting on a table i mean that's a pretty real life example and part of what i want to do is move this textbook uh, right or left what's interesting about friction is it's going to oppose motion regardless of the direction of movement so if i'm moving it to the right friction will act towards the left and if I move it to the left friction will change direction and act towards the right it's always trying to oppose motion um, what you'll notice is that no surface no two surfaces are ever perfectly smooth at all so I'm going to show you guys a quick uh, zoom in if I had to zoom into this particular region over here you'll notice that the book itself has uh, these kind of like valleys and and uh, mountains if you want to put it that way uh, and the same thing with with the table so even though to us at a macroscopic level it looks perfectly smooth at a microscopic level it's it's never the case even something like glass has these types of hills and valleys in it okay so as i'm trying to slide the book these hills and valleys of each surface will tend to interact and oppose motion and as I get to a certain critical point, parts of these, uh, I guess, molecular structures will shear off, making movement a lot easier. But that gets technical, and in the next video, that kind of gets explained in a little, little bit more detail. Uh, the other thing that I need to unpack, just in this introductory section, is the forces acting on this particular book. It's the book that I'm interested in, since it's the book that I am moving. So what are the forces acting on the book? So if I had to draw a free body diagram representing the book itself, um, all the forces, if it's under resting conditions, are balanced. So we know that there's a force of gravity acting downwards. And this force of gravity, which I'll just use uh, F sub G, is just equal to the mass of the book times the gravitational acceleration. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. If this was the only force acting on the book, then it would move down. However, the table is exerting a force on the book that is in the opposite direction. And it has to be perfectly opposite to this gr basically gravitational force. And that has a special name. So there's the, an upward force, equal but opposite in direction. And that's called the normal force. Uh, the reason it's called a normal force just purely means it's perpendicular to the surface. And under these conditions, when it's a level surface, is also going to be equal to mg. right? So these two forces are equal and opposite, and therefore tend to cancel each other out. That's one of the reasons why the book doesn't move down and doesn't move up. It just stays in place. The normal force is not always equal to mg. So the moment that the surface had to basically be inclined, uh, then this is no longer the case. However, normal always means perpendicular to the surface. So even when the surface is inclined, uh, the normal force will still be perpendicular, but it'll be of different magnitude. That's something we'll cover in a separate video. For now, please bear in mind that normal is always equal and opposite to the gravitational force. And in this case, when it's a level surface, they have the both they both have the same magnitude okay so the next part is what starts happening when I exert a force on this particular book so let's say for example I was exerting a force that is acting towards the left this is the force of me pushing right and we said in the introduction that the force of uh, friction is going to act in the opposite direction so it's going to be acting along this uh, surface over here 
and it's going to be acting to oppose motion so we'll just give this a little f to represent the force of friction okay so what ends up happening to this book is going to be dependent on the size of this frictional force what you'll find in the next video is that there are two types of frictional forces one is static friction in other words this is the friction that you have to overcome in order to get this book moving in the first place the second is dynamic friction meaning that there's a different type of friction that tends to act once the book is moving in the video that i want to show you guys which is about nine minutes long um, we will unpack what static and dynamic friction is and how it tends to interact with various objects um, however what i need to do is i need to unplug my microphone so that you guys can hear the voice uh, of the video uh, this video is courtesy of michael dubson um, he's a professor of physics and I think he does a really good job at explaining the concepts of friction and some of the calculations behind it. So uh, that's enough for me. I'll get back to you guys in about nine minutes time. There's a couple of empirical rules which describe friction very well. An empirical rule is a rule that's based on observation, based on experiment. There's sort of two cases that I want to consider. Case number one is involving surfaces sliding past each other. When surfaces are sliding past each other, we call that sliding or kinetic friction, or sliding friction. So here is a empirical rule. It's not a law because it's not obeyed 100% of the time, but it's remarkably accurate over a wide range of circumstances. So here's the rule for kinetic friction. The magnitude of the force of friction, and I'll use left for frictional force is equal to a constant mu sub k times the magnitude of the normal force. Okay, so little f again is the magnitude of the friction force. Big N is the magnitude of the normal force. And this mu sub k is called the coefficient of kinetic friction. Mu sub k is a dimensionless number. Notice F has the units of force, and N has the units of force. So for this equation to be dimensionally correct, mu sub k has to, has to have the units of nothing, dimensionless. Mu sub k is just a pure number. It, it's bigger than zero. And, well, it's seldom bigger than one. So smaller than or about equal to one is the upper limit. It could, in fact, be bigger than one. Let's measure the coefficient of kinetic friction here. I've got a, I've got a couple of blocks here. Uh, let me just take one of these blocks. This is a wooden block and it weighs 2.45 kilograms. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull on the side here until it starts sliding. And I notice that to make it slide, I need a force of about six and a half newtons. I've got a newton spring scale here. Depends on where I am on the surface. I notice that the friction's changing a little as I move along the surface. Different parts of the table have different, some, different amounts of friction. But this is a case where it's pretty easy to compute the coefficient of kinetic friction. Mu sub k is going to be the force of friction over the normal force. The force of friction I'm measuring. The normal force I know is going to be mg in this case. Okay, so the force of friction I measure to be about 7 newtons. Uh, M is 2.45 kilograms. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Time for my calculator. Let's work it out here. About 0.29. Use of keg for wood on this surface table here is about 0.29. Different sets of materials have different coefficients of kinetic friction. And there's no way to compute this. You just measure it. Now, this is sliding friction. And the first thing that's a little puzzling about this formula is most people, myself included, would have thought that the amount of friction would depend on the surface area. If I have lots of area, I must have big friction, right? This formula says that the uh, force of friction just depends on the normal force, not on the surface area. Let me do an experiment to try and convince you of that. I'm going to... 
two of these blocks together and measure the force of friction by seeing how big a how big a force I have to apply to make this thing slide along. About 15 newtons, 15 or 16 newtons, depending on where I am on the table. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stack the blocks. What have I just done to the area of contact? Cut it in half, right. What did I just do to the normal force? Nothing, right. It's, the normal force is still mg. So if you believe surface area is what's proportional to the frictional force, then I just halved the surface area, so I should get half the force of sliding friction I had before. Force of sliding friction I had before was, what was it, about 15 or 16 newtons? Okay, let's see what it is now. It's still about 15 or 16 newtons sort of flopping around, depending on where I am on the table. So, a wide range of experiments like this have shown that to a very good approximation, the force of friction, the force of sliding friction, is proportional to the normal force, and the coefficient of proportionality depends on the surfaces, and the only way to, well, like I said, you can't compute, okay, you just have to measure it. Now, there's another kind of friction that does not involve sliding. I'm going to pull to the right, right now I'm pulling to the right with a force of about 12 newtons, and yet the block doesn't move. What's preventing the block from moving? Friction, yeah. I've got no sliding, but clearly there's some friction. This is uh, what's called static friction. And notice that I can apply a little force, 6 newtons, or a big force, 13 newtons, and back to a little force, 8 newtons. The block doesn't move. What's the net force on the block right now? Zero, right. So, it must be that the force of static friction is changing so that the force of static friction always exactly cancels this variable force I'm exerting with my hand. So the first thing to notice about static friction is that it's, it's not one number like kinetic friction. Static friction is variable. The force of static friction, F static friction, that's the magnitude of the force of static friction, is, can be anything between zero and some maximum value, F max static friction. That maximum value has the following formula. Mu sub S times n. Capital N, again, is the magnitude of the normal force. Mu sub s is what's called the coefficient of static friction. In general, mu sub s is a little bigger than mu sub k. So experiment indicates that mu sub s, the maximum force, the coefficient that goes in the maximum force of static friction, is bigger than mu sub k. And you've noticed this in real life. If you've ever tried to move something heavy, like a refrigerator, across a um, kitchen floor, whenever the refrigerator is stopped, it's kind of hard to get it moving. But once you get it moving, it slides a little easier. To get it started, you've got to exert this force, the USN. But once it gets started, then to keep it moving, you apply this force, the mu KN. And I think you've noticed that it, it takes a bigger force to get it started than to keep it moving. And I want to try and demonstrate that here. So, let's measure the maximum force of static friction. So, how big is the force of static friction right now? Six newtons. And now it's eight. And now it's ten. Now it's twelve. I remember that the force of kinetic friction, when I had this thing sliding before, was around fifteen or sixteen. Well, I'm at fifteen now. Here's sixteen. Seventeen. 
jumped down as soon as it started moving. That's this experimental observation. The U.S. is bigger than the U.K. And you can sort of understand what's going on microscopically. If you looked at the surfaces in contact microscopically, you'd see hills and valleys. And the, the hills of one surface tend to settle into the valley of the other surface. And when you pull on one side, the surfaces are a little springy. The tips of the mountains are a little springy. So when you pull on one side, they pull back. And the harder you pull, the more they pull back. That's why the force of friction keeps adjusting itself to exactly cancel your force. But there's some maximum force you can apply where suddenly the tips of the mountain tops get sheared off and they start sliding past each other. Time for a cut. Okay, so that I think gives you a fairly good introduction in terms of what the concepts of friction are all about. And in part two of this video series, we will look at some applied examples. So I'll see you guys on the flip side.